Hey, welcome to Bigfoot for Breakfast, home of the mysterious and the macabre, where we sit in the studio every week challenging conventional thought. We are your hosts, Samantha Carter and Sarah Jones. We are very happy to be back in the swing of things, and we're even more happy that you're here listening to us. Don't forget to push that subscribe button and be sure to recommend us to a friend. Give the gift of Bigfoot for Breakfast this Christmas by recommending us to literally everyone. It seems like the word about podcasts is best spread by word of mouth. So tell your grandma or whoever you think would be interested in listening to this show. You can contact us at BigfootForBreakfast at Outlook.com or you can message us on Facebook, Instagram, or the Twitter and we'll get right back to you. You can also text us and call and leave a voicemail to be played on a future episode. We always love those. You can do this at 641 812-2635. With all that nonsense out of the way, let's get right into the show. Actually, let's don't. We got a review on our website. So we can go ahead and read that. Got a message from a Tracy Dorman, and she says she has just started listening to podcasts. I searched for Bigfoot because I believe in your podcast popped up. I am so glad I found it. You two have such great chemistry, and I can't help but smile and laugh along with you. Keep on keeping on. We just want to say thank you to Tracy for that encouraging message. I also want to apologize that when you were searching for a podcast about Bigfoot, you did not find that with us here at Bigfoot for Breakfast. Yeah, we have not yet done a Bigfoot episode after a year. So like Sam said, let's get right on into the show. The planet Earth is obviously an amazing place. Obvs. Obvs. The human race is intricate, complicated, and beautiful. It's miraculous, really, to look at our evolution over the expanse of time and see how far we've come, what we've created here. Our love and compassion for one another, our cities, our will to preserve what beauty the natural earth has to offer. The system of infrastructure and government that we have built and help us live our everyday lives. As a species, we're constantly evolving constantly thriving and moving. We go to work. We better ourselves day after day, constantly finding room for improvement. We love our families and fellow humans, raise our kids, go to their activities, help with homework, have constant home improvement projects, do things we enjoy and take things day by day. We often live our lives within this sort of bubble that we've created for ourselves. And that's okay because we're happy there for the most part. We're comfortable. It's ours. But imagine a scenario in which you're going about your routine business and all is right with the world and within your living bubble. Everything's normal. From one day to the next, you start kind of feeling like something is off, like someone might be following you around. And at first you think, surely not, because why would someone follow you? Yeah, why would anybody follow you? You're not even cool. Yeah, or important. You is kind, (laughs) but you is not important. (laughs) You know that's kind of crazy, but you keep seeing that car everywhere you go. Just sitting there. Is there someone inside? Why do you keep seeing it? That skateboarder seems like he's ridden past your office window over and over again today, as if on a loop. You swear you've seen him about 20 times, just casually riding by. Why would he be watching you? That woman walking her dog? She looks at you kind of weird every time she goes by you sitting on that park bench. Why have you seen her so much today? You start noticing these little things that seem to be happening over and over, and you start feeling like this is way too much of a coincidence. Things that no one else would necessarily notice, but you have. You start to confide in family members, telling them what's going on because you're kind of freaked out, but they kind of laugh it off and reassure you that it's probably all in your head. And at first, you think they're right. Probably. But over time, things only progress and it's moving fast. It's happening all the time. You know now that for some reason or another, you are being watched by seemingly everyone. People you didn't know at first, but now it seems like even people in your life are involved in some sort of plot to make you feel like you're crazy. Does your family know this is happening but won't tell you? Are they in on it? Are they helping them? You're getting phone calls now and you don't know who it is. They seem like they know things that they couldn't possibly know about your daily life. Your family has to be in on it. You know that this isn't some sort of mental illness. You're fine, and this is happening. You want to talk about it, but you're the only one who sees it, 
because you're paying attention now. You start hearing noises everywhere you go, little clicks, sounds like waves, even sometimes some voices, and it's incredibly disorienting. You're suspicious of everyone, the mailman, the grocery store clerk, your boss. You feel like everyone knows something that you don't, and your self-confidence and your self-esteem are plummeting because you're starting to feel like everyone is against you, or at least you aren't entirely sure who is and who isn't. Your family doesn't want to hear it anymore, and you can tell that they're getting annoyed, but it's so obvious and you want them to see it too. You want them to acknowledge that you aren't crazy, and you're starting to get scared and you feel alone, isolated. At this point, you can't really talk about it anymore. Your family is already convinced that it's a mental illness. There's no making them see that it's real. If you go to the police or the hospital trying to tell them that you're hearing noises and voices inside your head and that people are following you, calling you, even coming into your home to mess with you and move things around, that's just the first step on the train to a mental health facility. You start to withdraw from everything and everyone in your life. You don't like being social anymore and you start turning down invitations because you're too scared to go out, if you even get invited at this point. You're exhausted because you aren't sleeping well and your hygiene and appearance start taking a serious hit because what's the point? You hardly leave the house and you're depressed. Plus, you're pretty sure that everyone you know is talking about you, concerned about you. They think that you're either making it all up or that your sanity is slipping away and they're scared for you. But it is real and you don't know how to make them understand. In our research for another episode, we happened to stumble across this community of people that actually seems to be rather large, and it got us thinking about the effects of schizophrenia on the brain and how frustrating it would be trying to convince the people close to you that what you are seeing and what you know is happening to you is real because you're honestly perceiving it to be real when it truly isn't. It also got us thinking about the possibility that maybe not all of these people are crazy, quote unquote. Have you ever heard of something called a targeted individual? Well, we really hadn't either. But let's take a deep dive into the world of the T.I.'s. We've read about, heard about, and watched documentaries about different government programs that had been present in the past from various branches of the government and military. MK Ultra was supposed to be nothing more than a crazy conspiracy theory for the longest time, but that turned out to be real, and that's just one example. There are lots of others that were initially dismissed as hoaxes or conspiracies and then come to find out, 100% real. Why couldn't we just entertain for a moment that maybe there are groups of people associated with the government or not who are implemented in the business of behind-the-scenes attacks in order to make a person appear to be mentally ill, discredit them, and maybe even kill them for one reason or another. Like we said, it could be that they're a witness in a case, some sort of whistleblower, anything. Some people seem to be targeted completely at random. Some say that they think they're part of a government mind control experiment similar to MKUltra. Who knows? All we can tell is that there is a community of people who claim to be targeted individuals, and it's gotten pretty big. Sure, some of them are likely untreated schizophrenics or mentally ill, but maybe some of them are telling the truth, and this is really happening. It's really a big phenomenon with a lot of intricate parts, so we feel compelled to discuss it. The online community that we mentioned earlier is comprised of a pretty astounding number of people, and it isn't even limited to the online format. There's actually a conference held every year by these people. There are various support websites all over the place and originating in many different countries. There is a worldwide phenomenon and it consists of some people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, past government officials, government and military whistleblowers, people of this nature. The vast majority of them assert that they are not mentally ill. Think about it. If you were listening to someone tell you that the government was after them, people were following them, and harassing them, that their house had been bugged and nanotechnology chips had been implanted within their bodies to track them and to mess with their thought process, what would your immediate thought be? That the person that you were listening to was mentally unstable, right? Not that maybe they were telling the truth, but what if they were? They would literally have nowhere to turn if something like this were to truly happen to them. They would immediately be written off as crazy and likely end up with an involuntary committal to a mental health facility. No doubt. So this would truly be a very hopeless situation for a person enduring this. Add on top of this, not only the idea of gang stalking performed on behalf of the government, bugging and chipping that the person described frequently hearing voices inside their head. That would be enough to send it over the top for you, right? 
This person has to be mentally ill. These are all classic signs, but not so fast. We're going to explore this quite a bit deeper and find out if claims like this are really so outlandish after all. Bear with us. There's a lot of information and history to unpack here. Thousands and thousands of people all over the world are experiencing this phenomenon. We all know about it. It's pretty easily diagnosed. This is often the start of what we all know as paranoid schizophrenia, classic early warning signs of what will soon become a full-blown mental disorder that is complex and incredibly serious. People with no history of mental illness, childhood trauma, drug abuse, or anything of this nature can suddenly develop the disease and there's no stopping it. This is devastating and true, but it's also got to be true that some of these people who adamantly claim that they do not have a mental illness possibly don't. If you really think about it, if a person was evil enough, dedicated enough, and compelled enough, they could manifest those thoughts and symptoms in another person to an extent, making them appear to be mentally compromised. Imagine if there was a group of people who were being paid or compensated in some way to create this scenario for a person who has been targeted, say, by the government, or by a corporation looking to avoid a lawsuit, or maybe a wealthy socialite with connections trying to avoid a sexual assault allegation. Maybe the murder for hire trend is not not the only way to get rid of a witness against you. You already know that when people start talking about being followed, hearing voices, people being after them, it's pretty quickly dismissed as a mental illness. It's not like anyone will typically take these claims that seriously and investigate it. It's schizophrenia, right? Maybe it would be easier to hire a group who specializes in this sort of thing to drive your witness crazy, or at least make them appear to be so. No one would even look into it. This would discredit them pretty quickly, And it would be pretty effective for your agenda if it looked like that person had a mental health issue and it wouldn't be that hard to get away with. The hearing voices in your head claim is definitely not a new one. And we know what you're going to say. Neither is schizophrenia. But hear us out. There are references in the Bible of disembodied voices and voices heard by one person and no one else when many others were around. Joan of Arc was burned at the stake when she claimed this very thing and was seen as a heretic. She said that the voices guided her throughout her life to become the influential person that she eventually did. On the other hand, serial killers will often claim that the voices told them to do it. These targeted individuals often claim feeling disorienting energy that causes strange symptoms and sounds in their head, even sometimes voices, along with gang stalking. Gang stalking has been a thing for a pretty long time. Obviously, you might not be old enough to remember the Berlin Wall that divided East and West Germany. So when East and West Germany split up, East Germany had their citizens kind of locked down and they were not allowed to leave. They weren't even allowed to travel to and from. They weren't allowed to go into West Germany. And they had set up a list where civilians could sign up to become spies for East Germany and basically they would just be compensated monetarily to spy on anyone, anyone in their family, neighbors, friends, anyone who talked about defecting from East Germany, they would be reported and then they would be put on a list themselves for a process called Zersetzung in Germany. And this word actually meant degradation or decomposition, if that tells you anything. So they would send people out and basically bother these people and bother these people. And they would harass their employers. They would harass the people at their children's schools. They would get them fired from their jobs. They would get their kids kicked out of school, harass their neighbors and their banks, their financial institutions would cut them off and then they would have no jobs. So they wouldn't be able to pay for their houses. They would end up kicked out of their houses. Basically, the government would strip them of everything if they seem like they were trying to defect from East Germany. And the police actually implemented this. So this has actually been going on or things like this have been going on for a long time. And these are governmental programs, not necessarily in America, but all over the world, there are different things like this in more strict countries. So basically, they would just harass them and destroy their lives enough to where they ended up just doing what they were supposed to do. They just towed the line and followed all the rules of the East Germans. So big corporations and governments doing things like this, it's not necessarily out of line for that to happen. It's happened before in the past. On another note, There is also a program out there that is incredibly persistent and strange. So apparently this group called ROCA targets young people who have been in and out of trouble, are members of gangs, dealing and doing drugs in bad neighborhoods. They pick people out of this demographic and choose to help them straighten out pretty much by force without the person's consent or willingness to even participate in such a thing. They follow these subjects around 
show up unannounced, show up at their drug houses, their places of work, everywhere, trying to constantly help them lead a better life. The subjects will often ask them to leave them alone, yell profanities at them, spit at them, straight up sometimes go after them physically, but they will not back down. This group uses gang stalking tactics in order to break people down. A police officer describes them as relentless and persistent and states, once they grab onto you, they won't let go. On a TED Talk, a woman associated with this group named Molly Baldwin speaks about the group. She talks about how the group started almost 30 years ago. They go to different cities, talk to the cops, and generally ask them for a list of the 50 people in the area that they arrest the most, and then they get to work. They hit the streets and find them. They find them. They knock on doors, get told to go to hell, and they keep coming back. This is the ultimate no-means-go mentality. They do this over and over find them over and over trying to support them until finally the subject breaks down and agrees to attend their workshops, such as their get your life together school. The subject will often go for a while and then stop going, at which point the gang will find them again over and over until they come back. Now, ultimately, this sounds like a good idea. When young people are entrenched in a lifestyle, living a high risk life that they're used to, it's difficult to get out of. They know people in that life. Often their family is in that life. They have money-making opportunities, and these people basically pester the crap out of them until they are out of that lifestyle. But at the end of the day, they pick a person and gang stalk them until the subject decides to do what the organization wants them to do. And that's that. So this is just one example of a situation like this. So we can say that this is a thing, right? Gang stalking is a thing. The man who opened fire appeared troubled and thought the government was out to get him. That's how friends describe the life of Myron May shortly before the attack at the FSU library in Tallahassee Thursday. As sick as this may sound, I've even had uh, stalkers follow me into church um, while I was in uh, Las Cruces uh, and in Houston. I've had uh, stalkers follow me into church uh, to harass me. In his last words, May speaks of his paranoia and coins himself as a targeted individual who's been a victim of stalking and harassment. He talked about a trip to Houston where he said cars would drive by and honk their horns every 10 minutes to keep him on the edge and agitated. Father, forgive me for what I'm about to do. Forgive me for all of my sins, past sins, present sins, any future sins. I'm sorry that my faith was so weak. That was the voice of a man named Myron May. Myron was a man born in Dayton, Ohio, living with his mother until he was 12 years old and at that time moved to Florida to be raised by his grandmother. He was active in sports throughout high school and went on to do very well, graduated with honors with a degree in economics from Florida State University with only two minor interactions with the campus police that didn't amount to anything. He went to Texas after that and went to law school at Texas Tech. The future was bright. He was armed with a degree, ready to enter the world of law, had a great social life and a lot going for him. He started a cush job in Houston that paid roughly $150,000 a year. And then things started to go downhill. He only stayed at his job about two years before he resigned, and from there he pretty much bounced around from job to job, never keeping any for more than about nine months before quitting. He had been dating a pediatrician named Danielle, and they had been shopping around for wedding rings. Around March of 2014, Danielle started to know some disturbing changes in her husband-to-be. He started talking about other people that he knew in his professional life, and he seemed to be under the impression that they were out to get him constantly harass him, peeking around corners at him just to get under his skin and make him uncomfortable. He had felt like people that he worked with were messing with his money in order to put him into financial hardship so that they could continue their harassment without risk of him being financially able to fight back against it. He would stay with friends and become convinced that they had become involved in this campaign against him as well, accusing them of making noises in the house to drive him crazy and break him down. In a Psychology Today article before all of the paranoia really got started, Myron is stated to have feverishly sought help for months regarding the increasing lack of focus and sleep that he had been experiencing. He was prescribed medications like Wellbutrin and Vyvanse. 
Not long after this, he began having panic attacks at work and sought to have these medications adjusted. It wasn't much longer after this that he began to act strange. He was constantly concerned about his neighbors watching him now. He made police reports. He told the cops that there were cameras in his apartment and he could hear voices through the walls and that this was keeping him up at night and he was not sleeping. Myron's friends and family were incredibly concerned about the things he was talking about. He was really angry at his neighbors and he was absolutely sure that they were spying on him. He had expressed that he would like to purchase a gun and teach them a lesson. Of course, they got a hold of his psychiatrist who met with him ASAP and reported that he seemed to be doing just fine. Myron checked himself into a mental health facility and was released after only four days with a new prescription medication antipsychotic called Seroquel. It wasn't long after that that things got worse. He claimed that the police had turned against him and that he was being bugged. Still, no help was available from the mental health system as his friends and family desperately tried to seek it. May knew that something wasn't right and a couple of days later, he went to a police station trying to turn himself in, but he wasn't wanted for anything. His ex-girlfriend was on the phone and heard the entire interaction as the woman at the desk turned him away. A few weeks after this interaction, Myron May walked into the library at Florida State University campus with a gun. He shot and wounded three students before the police arrived and killed him. The thing about Myron is he had zero history of mental illness prior to this. He rose from an impoverished childhood and enrolled in FSU. He graduated with honors and went on to become a successful lawyer after he worked his butt off through law school to pay for it. Myron detailed his intentions in three videos that he uploaded onto YouTube, and he also mailed copies of these videos out to a few other people. He believed that he was targeted by the government and that he had been the victim of multiple different types of harassment, buggings, people were following him, and he believed that they were using some advanced type of technology to control his thoughts. According to an article by NBC News, he was, quote, in a paranoia-fueled state of crisis when he showed up at the library with a 380 semi-automatic pistol, shot three people, and then was killed by cops when he would not drop his weapon, end quote. He wrote some emails prior to going to the library as well to a few different friends and acquaintances. According to the NBC News article, he wrote to a woman named Renee Mitchell, who also claims to be a targeted individual. He told her that he had developed a scheme to expose what was really going on and that he needed her help, saying, quote, I don't want to die in vain, end quote. It seems as though Pittman never answered the email. He wrote to another friend saying that he is being cooked in his chair. He claimed to have been hit with direct energy weapons all evening and was feeling it in his chest, stating, it hurts really bad right now. It was only an hour later that he arrived at the FSU campus. Reports from friends and family indicated that he didn't trust the police. He thought his phone was bugged and thought there were cameras in his car. He wasn't sleeping. Another weird thing is that he sent messages to various friends saying that they would be getting packages from him. He sent photos of receipts for certified mail as well as tracking information, but the packages were never received. His intention was to bring awareness to the many innocent people who were targeted this way, although it has been hard to figure out why he chose the college from which he graduated in this shooting and why he thought that shooting random innocent people would bring the awareness that he wanted. Of course, it is widely seen by most of society and educated individuals who have studied the case of Myron May that he was likely descending into the dark abyss of delusion that is schizophrenia. But there is a whole other host of people who believe that this isn't necessarily so, that maybe Myron was a lot like them. Maybe he was targeted. Another man, Max Spears, passed away in the summer of 2016. So Spears was a man who made his way around Britain doing speaking gigs about important people within the government and high rollers within the entertainment industry, especially focusing on sexual abuse and exploitation of children. He talked frequently about a situation of sexual abuse at the Presidio military base in California that resulted in what he said was a government cover-up. The Presidio military base had a daycare center from which two children who attended there ended up with a sexually transmitted disease. After this, parents of over 60 children came forward alleging abuse of their children as well. These parents included a military dentist, military engineers, and various other professionals within the military with what sounds like good credibility. 
Long story short, it sounds like very young children were making claims about a man at the daycare and there was medical evidence of rape and STDs in these young kids. The army seemed in no hurry to bring charges and despite multiple claims and evidence, refused to bring charges for more than only a single incident of abuse. As more children started talking, they were mentioning more and more people from the daycare and even other locations. Despite more and more claims of other culprits, the army and court kept ignoring them, claiming that all of the victims had been identified and that the daycare center was safe. All charges ended up being dropped. Apparently, come to find out, the army had dealt improperly with many issues involving sexual abuse of children for years prior to this one. These were the types of things that Max Spears was addressing. He also talked about the people ruling the world from behind the scenes, the people that he referred to as the unseen, basically our version of the New World Order. He talked about being part of a super soldier program when he was a child and that he was one of 40 of these kids who had been trained from birth to fight the unseen. If we disappear after this, it's super sus, guys. Max Spears said that to you. I mean, exactly my point. Oh. If suddenly we stop putting out episodes and we disappear, look for us. Yeah, check on check on us. We're not okay. After his death, a documentary was made by the BBC in which his friends were interviewed describing him as intelligent and fun. His friend went on to say that he first met Max while they were in Canterbury, England. And at that time, they were both being followed by multiple agents. One of the agents triggered Max with a trigger word suggesting that Max had been programmed as a child in this way to react when a trigger word was executed. People who have been programmed by the government as children for one reason or another often end up with personality problems and addictive personalities. These are two things that were characteristic of Max, reportedly. He did have a prescription drug problem after he broke his pelvis at one point in his life and was prescribed them. In April of 2016, Three months prior to his death, he spoke at a Project Earth conference at which he stated that he had been under constant attack, physical, astral, and psychic, in order to stop him from speaking there. In the very last interview that Max did, he talked about feeling terrible. He described feeling very tired. He felt as though he was being attacked and that his face was on fire. When Max died, he was staying with a woman named Monica Duvall, who he had met weeks earlier. She was the one who found him and called the ambulance. He had taken some Xanax and fallen asleep on her couch. Earlier that morning, she reported that he had a high fever and vomited about two liters of thick black liquid. When she noted that he wasn't breathing several hours after falling asleep, she turned him onto his side and more of the thick black liquid poured out of his mouth. She called the ambulance and he was pronounced dead at the scene. Max's body was taken back to England and an autopsy was performed coming back inconclusive. So you think this would be pretty cut and dry, right? A man overdosed on prescription medication on a friend's couch and passed away. But the prosecutor's office in Poland actually opened an investigation into the death of Max Spears, calling it involuntary manslaughter. In a BBC interview with the investigator, he stated that he was interviewing everyone that was present at the time of Max's death, indicating that there were more people at the apartment than just Monica, and they seemed suspicious. Max's mother seemed to believe that what happened to her son was no accident and was not natural. He had his problems, but he had been otherwise healthy at the time. Although tons of people came forward alleging that Spears' death was likely not accidental, the UK authorities decided not to investigate. His mother was especially frustrated because a mere two days prior to his death, she had spoken to Max and he indicated that he felt that he had gone too far, that he would likely be killed. For months before his death, he talked about being followed and being harassed, getting messages, and he sent her a text message two days before his death as well that said, quote, your boy's in trouble. If anything happens to me, investigate. Max's online following is huge, or was huge and still is, really. They will state to this day that he was a targeted individual as well. So say you were a government whistleblower, a witness in a high profile case of some sort, someone who has helped another person in a situation like this. What if there was a behind the scenes operation that a person could access and pay money to to have you followed? Not only followed, but obviously followed. People would come in and move things around in your house, knock on your doors at night, access the electronic devices in your home in order to spy on you, make noises in your home constantly to drive you crazy, things of that nature. Now that doesn't sound so bad. But really, really try to think about it. Put yourself in these shoes. 
You're always alone, so you can't really prove it. These people who call themselves targeted individuals have literally nowhere to go. If they tell the people close to them, they sound crazy. If they tell the police, they sound crazy. Even as a healthcare professional who has dealt with many people with multiple mental illnesses, when someone says something like this to me, my first thought is not that they're telling the truth most of the time. So what would a person like this do if this was really happening to them? If things like this were really happening to a person and they were really put at the mercy of some sort of program like this, The way that it would make them act would look eerily similar to paranoid schizophrenia, and that would likely earn them the diagnosis rather than an investigation. Maybe that's the entire plan, to discredit a person. And even if, in the end, the plan was to kill them, it would be a lot easier to make it look like a schizophrenic person just committed suicide or overdosed without an extensive investigation being launched by any sort of authority. So since they have no outlet for escape, it seems, I'll tell you exactly what a targeted individual would do. They would do exactly what they did. They use the internet to find other people who are in the same boat, someone who would believe what they were saying, that they aren't mentally ill, and then these people would band together, just like they have seemed to do. There was a video that we found on YouTube posted by a man named Bradley Scott dedicated to people just like this in which he gave specific information and advice to his fellow targeted individuals who have been newly targeted. In this video, he tells them to get rid of anything electronic that is able to track or surveil them. The most important thing is to get used to not taking your phone with you when you leave the house and keep apps off your phone that track people's online movements such as Facebook Messenger. He advises them to be unpredictable in their behavior. Leave the house at different times if you can and don't get deep into your habits. Keep as much money as you can and don't buy frivolous items. Keep your closest relationships in good standing. If you're going to talk to someone about what's happening to you, Try very hard to present this information in the most sane and reasonable way possible. The entire goal of the targeting is to make you feel and to make it appear to others that you are mentally ill and not credible. Beyond that, he advises you not go to the police. It is impossible to describe what's going on with you without making it sound like you simply have a mental illness and they will always allude to that before they believe you. Instead, focus your time on educating yourself about your enemy. Seek out resources and other people who are targeted for advice. The enemy is trying to break you down, so do your best to keep your mind positive, keep moving forward without letting them get to you. Another man named Marshall Thomas, armed with a PhD, made a video that sounds almost like he thinks that it is more of a game. He states that the entire thing is conducted through United States intelligence agencies, DARPA, Stanford Research Institute, Los Alamos National Laboratories, and a few really big corporations. They target people who are usually political whistleblowers or some kind of activists with relatively high intelligence who have been or have the potential to become threatening. This game uses incredible technology to track the subject everywhere they go. Attacks on the subject are taken out using microwave technologies and incredibly intense and tireless stalking methods. The end usually results in the death of the subject either from exhaustion or from ionizing radiation due to the microwave weapons that are aimed at and placed around places in which the subject normally frequents, their car, their home, and their work. The weapons can deliver continuous or frequent shocks and burns to the subject throughout the day and interrupts their sleep constantly in order to slowly break them down. He describes some things that happen to those people who are targeted. These are as follows. Typically, the organized stalking gangs will follow the target into stores or to their place of work or anywhere in the community. They will, in effect, surround them at a restaurant sitting at nearby tables and begin to say inappropriate things to them. The target walking down the street, perhaps, will be cursed by total strangers who may stand in front of them and block their path, spit right in front of them, physically invade their space and bump into them on purpose in a manner that is indistinguishable from that of an accident. When the target is alone, these stalkers are very brazen and will go right up to them and curse them and say the same negative things, the keywords that are being used in the microwave broadcasts. The organized stalkers 
are given clues how to verbally harass the target, such that what is said to them in public by total strangers is exactly more or less what is said to them through the microwave hearing attacks. He goes on to list that they will catch them alone, yelling insults at them, attacking their physical appearance, their hygiene, their intellect, anything they can to break the person down. This will put the target into a victim mentality and a never-ending cycle of fear and loneliness. They will be scared to even go out in public. The stalkers are typically paid small amounts of money each time they participate. Other stalkers are full-time participants and are professionals. They do all of this in a way that is totally deniable. It's easy for the stalker to distance themselves from what they're doing because it is carefully executed and somewhat minor. Minor offense after minor offense until the subject completely depletes mentally. Death by a thousand paper cuts, if you will. There are weapons out there that can be used to control your emotions and often your actions. Make you hear things, make you see flash imagery, send continuous negative verbal messages and thoughts. This was called microwave hearing and it was perfected by Dr. Alan Fry in the 50s. With CIA funding, a man named Dr. Ewan Cameron came up with something called psychic driving. Fun fact, this was one of many psychological experiments in which humans unknowingly participated in that earned huge lawsuits against the CIA. With psychic driving, Dr. Cameron used the negative microwave messages to crowd out the target's own inner dialogue in order to break the target down. This is called depatterning. Typically, people would be drugged, and then forced to listen to recorded messages repeated constantly for hours on end in order to reshape their mindset. Supposedly, there is technology that allows for implementation of psychic driving via microwave weapon technology. So, negative streams of messages can be sent right into your brain on the microwaves that are being aimed at you, which is super scary. But is it true? Does this exist? We are not sure. But we do know that technology that was once considered to be outlandish and conspiracy-laden has turned out to be very real in the past. And we also know that in the past, claims of things that the government and the CIA were doing to civilians were considered to be absolutely crazy and untrue. And then they turned out to be real. It wasn't even until 1997 that tighter restrictions on human experiments, including accountability and transparency, were implemented when the Clinton administration revised protocols. Which really surprises me. (laughs) (laughs) As far as mind control and mind-altering weaponry which are considered to be non-lethal weaponry, there are treaties between countries that demand transparency for things like this because it's kind of an unfair war tactic that should only be used in certain situations. This really came about after the incredibly psychologically abusive Cold War tactics came to light. It's obviously an international concern, so it's difficult to discount things like this. Is there proof of this? Maybe. But we'll get to that here in a little bit. According to many of these targeted individuals, in addition to all of these mind-altering methods taken out on the subject, the gang-stalking tactic that we talked about earlier often goes hand-in-hand with this. Organized gang stalkers use the internet and their cell phones to locate the target and continuously mess with them to further break down their mind. This is so relentless that it drives the person away from their family and friends, often out of their own community and safety net, With the combination of this and the implementation of microwave technology feeding negative thoughts into your mind and causing great deals of pain, eventually it is typical for the subject to commit suicide. All of this done without ever having touched the target even one time. How convenient, right? Have you ever had a bully in your life? Maybe one of those elementary school bullies who would do little things to you that wasn't necessarily notable to the teachers or to your peers, but that you definitely notice. Hitting you in the hallway with a book or accidentally tripping you, giving you dirty looks when no one is looking or saying mean things to you when no one is around and then acting super nice when you are among people. I think we've all encountered someone like this at some point in our lives. The way that they do it is sneaky. It's small things that build up to big feelings. But if you tell people about it, they just tell you that you're imagining it and that the person is actually really nice. They make you feel like it's your mind playing tricks on you and that you're being dramatic. But you're not being freaking dramatic. That person is an asshole. So imagine being followed around continuously by more than one, sometimes reportedly up to 20, individuals like this who are being paid to torment you. Day after day, night after night, week after week, month after month, sometimes for even years. And on top of that, 
them having the ability to shoot mind bullets directly into your brain. No thank you. Remember Myron May, the shooter that we talked about earlier? If he wasn't a paranoid schizophrenic, and he was actually targeted like he said he was, maybe that's why he broke down and did what he did. He couldn't take it anymore, and he thought he could make it stop. We're not justifying what he did, obviously. It's awful. And we don't know that he wasn't mentally ill. It's hard to say why he went to his alma mater and chose to shoot and injure seemingly random individuals. But we are just saying, what if some of these situations in which crazy things happen and crazy claims are made aren't what they seem to be? What if the random people were the people that were harassing him? I don't know. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, how do we how do we know what's going on inside someone's head or like maybe behind the scenes when people say things like this? You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. The Church of Scientology is supposedly notorious for using gang stalkers for their agenda. I'm willing to say that this is a great example because there's quite a lot of proof of this. Videos in which they're confronted and don't deny it at all. They have never even really tried to deny it. A journalist in 1976 named Paulette Cooper had written a book about the religion, and they weren't exactly happy about the publicity of this sort. They issued a campaign of gang stalking intended to drive her to suicide. They were caught, and they ended up having to compensate her for emotional damage that they caused her. Another woman named Monique Rathbun wasn't even a Scientologist, but her husband was, and he decided to leave the church and started a blog which talked crap about the Church of Scientology. After that, their home and an article about them showed up in a Scientology propaganda magazine. Then, she started getting anonymous emails threatening her and warning her that she better leave her husband. Not only that, she was delivered letters at her work talking about her husband's dirty secret. A smear campaign was started after she didn't leave him. Entire websites dedicated to her that were covered in lies. Groups of people would gather around her home and yell things at them. They would knock on their doors and follow them around. About times when her husband would be out of town, she stated in an article, they knew he was gone and they always knew what we were doing. Obviously, they were there to let me know that they knew that I was alone. They went so far as to rent a house so close to hers that they could see her home from that one 24-7. Not only that, later she stated, that she found a camera on a tree behind their house. These are just a couple of examples. There are hundreds, thousands. The Church of Scientology employs a tactic called fair game to deal with people that they see as enemies of the church. They are seen as a threat to the church and are allowed to be punished freely using any and all means possible. In 1981, they employed fair game harassment techniques on a man called Jacob Anderson and admitted that they did this to get him committed to a psych hospital. In 1984, another man, a doctor at Harvard Medical School, endured the church's fair game policy as well. They snuck into the hospital and stole patient medical records and then tracked down his patients to harass them. In 1989, a man named Pat Broker left the church and it doesn't even sound like he was threatening them. Church leader David Miscavige apparently paid PIs to follow him for 25 years while he moved about Wyoming and then to the Czech Republic for medical school. He paid them $32,000 a month for 25 years. So if you think that some organizations or people aren't shady enough or rich enough or concerned enough to institute some psycho stuff like this, even besides the government, You're mistaken. A few very detailed websites have been built and exist dedicated to the issue of targeted individuals. A nonprofit organization called Targeted Justice was established in 2017 to bring light to this issue, and a quick review of their board of directors reveals a whole new slew of seemingly credible individuals from various skill sets and professions, such as medical professionals, a neuroscientist, PhD professor, filmmakers, investigative journalists, and a NASA engineer. 
They describe a targeted individual as a person who has been selected by the deep state, typically the FBI, DHS, and CIA, to unwillingly participate in an experimental government torture program. They state that it all started with the MK Ultra project. They use different methods to break down and neutralize a person by placing various levels of psychological, physical, and emotional stress on them to test different methods and how effective they are. The plan seems to be that they will later use whichever method turns out to be the most effective to eventually control the population. Once regular people figure out what the government is able to do and the methods are perfected, they will be too afraid and intimidated not to comply with whatever agenda they're pushing. Right now, the majority of the people selected to unwillingly participate are labor union leaders, political activists, scientists, and whistleblowers, plus some randomly chosen people as well. The experimentation is extremely detrimental to the victims' lives and often completely destroys personal relationships intentionally as a part of the program. They use direct energy weapons to mess with them as well as gang stalking. This website goes on to talk about the Schriever Air Force Base near Colorado Springs. They state that the CIA and the Air Force operates a microwave weapons program in an underground complex at this base and are able to form digital beams using the cell phone towers via the Vercator Microwave Satellite Weapon. This is a type of weapon that was supposedly used on diplomats at the U.S. Embassy in Cuba in a situation that we will talk about later in this episode. This type of technology causes several different physical symptoms and the subject can typically feel when they're being hit with it. The Targeted Justice website even goes as far as to say that messages can be embedded in these microwave frequencies and aimed at an individual in order to send constant negative messages directly to your mind, kind of like we mentioned earlier. What we didn't mention earlier is that the symptoms noted while experiencing microwave radiation is called the Frey Effect after a man named Dr. Alan Frey. In 1947, it was noted that radar operators would hear strange clicks and buzzing sounds when they were using the equipment when no one else could hear it. Dr. Frey started a study on the bioeffects of microwave radiation and was funded by, guess who? The Army and the Navy. Long story short, he figured out that the reason that strange effects were noticed by people who were exposed to microwaves was due to a rise in temperature and thermo elastic expansion of tissue followed by generation of pressure waves which travel to the inner ear cochlea with subsequent auditory nerve activation. When he experimented on frogs and rats aiming the microwaves at them in various frequencies, these were his findings. Frey caused rats to become docile by exposing them to radiation at an average power level of only 50 microwatts per square centimeter. He altered specific behaviors of rats at 8 microwatts per square centimeter. He altered the heart rate of live frogs at 3 microwatts per square centimeter. At only 0.6 microwatts per square centimeter, he caused isolated frogs' hearts to stop beating by timing the microwave pulses at precise points during the heart rhythm. So from that, we can conclude that modern technology and this use of microwaves in combination with this could be possibly aimed at humans in order to mess with their minds, cognitive ability, make them feel disoriented, or even mess with your heart rate at the point of stopping it without ever even having touched them. You know those weird stories you hear about when someone dies unexpectedly and inexplicably and they say, quote, the government probably caused a heart attack. Things that make you say, hmm. Later on in the 70s, another professor by the name of James Lynn took this study a step further by implanting a device called a hydrophone into the brains of animals in order to measure the effect that the microwaves really had on the brain and they found that pressure waves were indeed formed inside the brain in response to the microwaves being aimed at it because of the rapid pressure rises from intermittent waves being pulsed through it. As tissue heats up, it expands. So intermittent waves were causing intermittent periods of increased brain pressure. Apparently, there was an article on the U.S. Army website at some point talking about microwave weapon implementation that was at some point later permanently deleted, but not before a few people who had come across it had already taken screenshots of it. The article defines this as non-lethal weaponry and states, quote, 
a neuromagnetic device which uses a microwave transmission of sound into the skull of a person's or animal's by way of pulse-modulated microwave radiation, and a silent sound device which can transmit sound into the skull of a person or animal. The sound modulation may be voice or audio subliminal messages. One common application is the use of an electronic scarecrow to frighten birds in the vicinity of airports. This is called V2K. V2K is also a real thing. A patent application can be found from October 22nd of 2002 for a device that does just this. Inventors are listed as O'Loughlin and the applicant is the United States of America as represented by the Secretary of the Air Force for the manufacture and use by or for the government for governmental purposes. It delivers microwaves directed at a person with implanted messages to be delivered across space without others hearing them. This can be handy in war and in a spy situation, surely. But it can also be handy if they, for whatever reason, wanted to make it seem like there were voices inside a person's head. It sounds like they started working on this technology after discovering the clicks in the 40s, thinking that they could envelope speech messages to be carried on the audio waves that the microwaves produced but were unsuccessful for a long time. Until recently. We'll put the link to that patent in our sources so you can check it out and see what you think. At the CIA.gov library reading room website, there is a document that goes into foreign and domestic weaponry of this nature. It's called Psychic Warfare, Exploring the Mind Frontier. This was written in 1988 and is the unclassified property of the U.S. government. It talks about lots of interesting things, actually, but especially applicable to our episode today is its listing of foreign psychotronic weaponry that was known to have been developed by what was the Soviet Union at that time. A few of them are listed as death radiator, brain link, brain probe, disease radiator ray, emotion radiator ray, teleporter prototype, distant telepathy, mental implantation. We all know that America has been keeping pace and paying attention to what Russia was developing for decades. So if they're doing it, we're doing it. And this was in 1988. Think of the advanced technology we have now. How far have they come with this weaponry that can screw with our minds? If you're interested in more reading similar to this that we have found super interesting, you can find a paper called U.S. Electromagnetic Weapons and Human Rights at projectcensored.org. That's a pretty good one too. To quote this paper, quote, The basic ability to enter a person's mind is not a futuristic fantasy. This is real and in prototype. DARPA began this research in 1983. The internet has become a focal point in our lives with reliance on information and communication. Our interaction and intimacy with computers is increasingly pervasive, as is our exposure to the field of augmented cognition. DARPA does not address the implications of such symbiosis or the dilemma of the extent to which a person can or should be manipulated. The use of this technology is used for military purposes, but it may not be long until it is to, quote, improve the factory worker prisoners, or the mentally ill. So when someone is telling you that they are hearing voices, just know that the technology actually does exist for this to happen, even if it were unlikely that this is being used on a civilian for no reason, the government has done some weird things in the past. Imagine if you were targeted. How would you even go about telling people what is happening to you? Even if you did get people to believe you, what could you do about it? What could they do about it? If you went beyond your friends and family and took it to the authorities, would they believe you? What could they do about it? It would feel so hopeless, even in the unlikely situation that people didn't immediately dismiss you as mentally ill. Not only are people possibly enduring these negative messages sent to them via microwave weapons, we also know that there are weapons that have been employed called pulsed energy projectiles. These are rays directed at a subject that have the capacity to paralyze them with pain. Remember how Myron May said that he felt incredible pain while sitting in his chair and indicated that he felt like it was a weapon? This is also the claim of thousands of other proclaimed targeted individuals everywhere. These can reach people as far as two kilometers away. There is also evidence that these weapons have effect on the subject's brain and cause behavior changes, severe sleep disruption, anxiety, and fear. Sounds familiar, right? The Special Repertoire for the UN on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane, Degrading Treatment or Punishment, Mr. Niles Melzer wrote to the Freedom for Targeted Individuals organization requesting information regarding this phenomenon 
and the amount of people claiming to be gang stalked and electronically targeted. He received a very detailed response from the vice president of FFTI, Matthew Arnegard, and Miss Ella Free, the president of FFTI. In this letter, they claim to be representative of approximately 15,000 people in America and abroad who are victims of organized gain stalking, as well as remotely delivered directed energy assault. The two of them themselves claim to have experienced and are experiencing gang stalking and energy weapon assault as well, and this is what encouraged them in the direction of advocacy work in the cases of others. They go on to talk about the directed and pulsed radio frequency microwave energy weapons that are used to cause sensations of pain, impairment of muscle function, capillary damage and bruising, inflammation, burns, eye damage, heart damage, and various sensory phenomenon, which is a scientifically proven ability, although not widely used. These microwave energies are simply directed at a person from someone who is able to hide and remain unseen so that the victim is merely feeling these horrible sensations without knowing where they're coming from. They can be delivered even through walls and ceilings, citing a case in 2018 in which 21 U.S. citizens serving as ambassadors to the embassy in Havana, Cuba, at different times experienced directional energy aimed at them in their hotel rooms and all experienced very similar symptoms. They could all feel the energy hitting them and all described it coming from the same direction and causing headaches, dizziness, sharp ear pain, vertigo. They heard noises coming from different directions that many of them described as high-pitched beams of sound, incapacitating sound. Others described it as a baffling sensation. There were various tests performed on these people, including CT scans that showed significant brain changes after the event as well as ongoing symptoms. There was testimony heard before the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere in which the situation was described. They stated that the diplomats serving at the embassy complained about hearing strange noises and unexplained physical symptoms. The investigating department medical professionals described the symptoms and CT results as what appeared to be what one would diagnose as mild traumatic brain injury or concussion and aligned with mild traumatic brain injury or trauma of a non-natural source. This was not the only time this was said to have happened. It is speculated widely by various experts that this was some sort of direct energy weapon aimed at these people who were working at the embassy, and a few more attacks happened afterwards, and they even thought that it had likely happened a few other times before, as early as 2016 in Havana on embassy personnel, at the diplomatic residences, and at hotels based on a few past reports. They ended up evacuating 24 confirmed victims from Havana, so... So I'm guessing that the evidence was more than enough to take it seriously. This is just one example of things like this happening, so it isn't as though weapons like this don't exist. If you're ever in a position to hear a person tell you that they feel as though they have been targeted by a strange weapon shooting microwaves at them in order to make them feel disoriented, it may sound far-fetched and crazy. It certainly may be possible. If they're being used in this way, directed at embassy personnel, why would it be unreasonable to think that it wouldn't be in the hands of a domestic people in the United States to target whistleblowers and party defectors on either side? Maybe it's crazy. Maybe it's not. I can't help but throw in this idea that I had while researching this. Remember our very first episode about the nine hikers who died at Dyatlov Pass? <gasps> right? Remember how the things that they did on that mountain seemed unreasonable and strange? Remember how there were high amounts of radiation found on some of them? Also remember how some of them were found to have endured some sort of large crushing type injuries internally with no outward signs of trauma. I just wonder if something like this type of weaponry could have possibly been involved. Seems to fit right in, doesn't it? Like a weird, macabre puzzle. Hmm. So hopefully this gives you a little insight into the life of a proclaimed targeted individual. We appreciate you tuning in this week and we hope that you'll do so again next week. If you like the show, please remember to press the subscribe button on whichever podcast platform you happen to be listening from. We also always love hearing from you guys, so if you'd like to contact us for any reason, you can email us at bigfootforbreakfastatoutlook.com or you can send us a message on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also text us or leave us a voicemail to be played on the next episode at 641-812-2635. Thank you for stopping by. Come at me, bro.